Okay, good morning everybody in Hazak Ubaruch. Thank you for joining us on this beautiful Thursday morning, Motza'e Yom Kippur. Rabotai, Yom Kippur was fantastic here in the synagogue and I hope you had an inspirational, a meaningful Yom Kippur as well. And Hashem should help us and Hashem should bless us. And there's a very beautiful um, analogy, joke, if you will. Not a, not a ha-ha-ha joke, but a cute joke. Listen to this joke, my friends. This Israeli guy comes to America that's not the joke. This Israeli guy comes to America and he wants to try to make parnasa. He wants to try to make some money and he wants to open up a store. I don't know if he's selling Dead Sea products or whatever he's selling, you know, whatever Israelis sell. But he wants to sell, you know, some, some stuff. And he, he needs to know in America what attracts customers. In Israel, you offer a free shawarma, a guy comes in. But in America, it doesn't fly. So what does a guy do to try to bring in customers to the store? So he walks through Madison Avenue, Fifth Avenue. He walks through the city and he looks around to see what exactly do people do to bring in Zboon, to bring in customers. And he notices one store is jam-packed. Jam-packed, everyone's in there, place is busting. The guy says, wow, this store must be successful. This store is is obviously they, they know what to do. And he looks in front of the store and he sees this big sign. And the, what does the sign say? Grand opening. Big grand opening. The guy says, wow. I don't know what that means. Grand opening. He doesn't speak English. Aval, it must be that sign brings in customers. He walks to another few stores down. He sees another store packed. Place is packed. From front to back the guy says wow this store is also packed he looks at the front he sees a different sign he doesn't know what it means but he sees a different sign what does the sign say this time different store going out of business the guy says wow imagine i have a brilliant idea this israeli guy right he's got a jewish brain he says i'm gonna take both sides put them together i'll bring even more people so the guy goes out he tells listen i need you to make me a custom-made banner Grand opening, going out of business. I don't know what it means, but I'm sure, I'm sure that those two together. Of course, you could imagine the guy <clears throat> puts a sign in front of a store. Nobody walked in. Nobody walked in. The guy's a dim. The guy's what he's doing, right? Nobody, obviously, no one walks into the store because they know this guy. Grand opening, going out of business, right? Okay, very cute, very cute joke. But my friends, what's the lesson? What's the message of this joke? You know, we all laugh at this guy. Ah, you fool! You fool! No, no, no. Me and you. Me and you. A lot of us make this mistake of this guy. We come to Yom Kippur, and Yom Kippur for us is a grand opening. It's this huge day where we come to shul, we come to synagogue. But my friends, for how many people is the day of the grand opening the same day that they're going out of business? And as they're sitting there in shul, ready to pray. But it's also the last day that they're going to be in shul for another year. It's the day that they go out of business. How many boys they turn bar mitzvah. And it's a grand opening for them as they enter Judaism. And it's a day that they're going out of business. I won't, the guy won't come to shul till it's his own son's bar mitzvah. Very sad story. There was once a family, they threw a son's bar mitzvah in the synagogue and they brought a very special and dear uh, cup that was in the family uh, heirloom, that was in the family tree for many, many years. And they brought this kiddush cup for the rabbi to do, uh, to do uh, you know, uh, what's it called, a kiddush on at the bar mitzvah. Anyways, anyways, Rabotai, listen to the story. It happens to be at the end of the bar mitzvah, everyone goes home. The family gets home, they look around and say, you know, where's that kiddush cup? Where's the Kiddush cup? They call the rabbi and say, Rabbi, you did Kiddush. You didn't give us back that goblet. The rabbi says, well, it's not here in the synagogue. We gave it back. The family, they got very upset. They said to the rabbi, what are you trying to steal from us? You're taking from us our goblet? This is very expensive. Rabbi, give it back. We, we demand that you return the goblet. The rabbi said, listen, I promise it's not here in the synagogue. I gave it back to you. It's not here. You, you have to check with all of your goods, with all your merchandise. They looked through, the, they looked through everything that they brought with them to the synagogue. They couldn't find the goblet. Well, this family became very bitter at the rabbi, at the synagogue, at Judaism. They ostracized the rabbi. They excommunicated him from their lives. We're never speaking to you again, you thief. You stole our goblet. Rabotai, Rabotai, you won't believe this. Fast forward 10 years. When this bar mitzvah boy 
was getting married. And on the day of his wedding, he decided, you know what? I'm getting married today. I should put my tefillin on. The kid didn't wear his tefillin in 10 years. The day of his wedding, he pulls out his tefillin bag. And as he opens it up for the first time, he finds right on top the goblet. He finds the kiddush cup from his bar mitzvah. He couldn't believe it. He calls his parents. He says, Dad, Mom, I found the kiddush cup. They said, what do you mean? Where'd you find it? He said, look, it was right here in my koracha all along. It must be the rabbi right after the kiddush. He rinsed it and he put it in the talit bag, assuming the kid was going to open it the next morning and he was going to find it. But you know what the sad thing is? For this kid, his grand opening was his going out of business. He turned bar mitzvah and sayonara, see you in 10 years, God. How, how sad that some people, they come to shul and as they kiss that Torah and ne'ilah, they give a Torah a kiss and he says, God, I'm going to miss you. And it's the last time that he kisses the Torah till next Yom Kippur. You know, the Kohen Gadol on Yom Kippur, there's a few things that he does in the, in the Beit HaMikdash. If you think you had a hard day yesterday, I want you to put yourself in the Kohen Gadol's shoes. Okay? The guy was fasting. He wasn't a young guy, by the way. Probably an old guy. Fasting. Barefoot. In the temple, you're barefoot. It's cold. It's already October. It's freezing. Mountains of Jerusalem. The guy's fasting all day. The guy is tired. And he's got a whole day of work ahead of him. Okay? The Kohen Gadol, like me, like a rabbi, he works on Yom Kippur, right? Okay, fine. What does he do on Yom Kippur? He's doing sacrifices. How many animals the guy has to kill? He's doing the lottery. He's leaning on the animal. He's catching the blood. He's running in. Achad ve'achad. Achad ve'sheva. Right? He's counting up, counting down. One, seven. He's going in the mikveh five times throughout the day. He's washing his hands and his feet before the mikveh and after the mikveh. And he's changing his clothing from gold to white, back to gold, back to white. Carrying the shovel with the flour, pouring it on. Achad asar samanim. The whole day. Busy day. And we, by the way, I'm not telling you knew, you, you knew this. We did it yesterday in the Seder Avodah. I'm sure it went for a lot of money in your synagogue, right? They sell the peticha and everyone comes and the guy who opens it up and we read about it, and then we go on the floor. Baruch Shem Kevod Malchuto, right? We go, we, we, we enact, we, we, we react the whole uh, Avodah. Rabotai, there's a very powerful question over here that Rabbi Bernstein brings down. You know, I understand why he washes his hands nine times. Nine out of ten, I understand. The first nine makes sense. He's about to do avodah. He's about to do something, whether it's bringing in a shovel or taking out the shovel or killing the animal or catching its blood or sprinkling its blood, whatever it is, but it's part of the avodah. It's an important avodah. It's something that he has to do in the temple because it's part of the service of Yom Kippur. So I understand why he's washing his hands before nine times. My only question is, what about time number 10? The 10th time. Why is he washing his hands? Let's pay attention to what's about to happen. Okay? The guy finally finished. He's done ski. He's, he read the Torah to everybody. He finished the Avodah. The guy's wearing his jeans, Yanni. He's wearing his overalls, whatever he's wearing. He's ready to go home. And then he has to wash a 10th time before he, before he leaves. Wash your hands. See you later. You know, usually, you know, you go into someone's house. They're very particular on COVID. You walk in and say, hello, please wash your hands. Wash your hands. It sinks that way. Take off your shoes. But when you're leaving the guy's house, you don't care if you wash your hands. You want to pick your nose. You want to lick your fingers. You want to, you know, you want to touch, uh, you know, your, your sweaty armpits. Do whatever you want. You're going out of my house. I could, get, I could care less what you do. Go enjoy. You can kiss the floor if you want. Lick the floor. Whatever you like. Do whatever you want. In my house, you take off your shoes and you wash your hands. When you leave, I don't care. You want to wash your hands. You don't want to wash your hands. Well, it's up to you, man. It's very interesting that all of a sudden, my friends, take a look. All of a sudden. Ay, ay, ay. And Yom Kippur, as the guy's heading out, he washes his hands. And there's a very, very important lesson to learn over here. Please pay attention to this. You know, Yom Kippur is a very powerful day. You know, I want you to just think about yesterday, wherever you were, everyone I spoke to, for some reason, this year, Yom Kippur, they said was special. One guy actually I spoke to, has he, he said he wasn't feeling good. He was with his in-laws. No, I'm kidding. He wasn't feeling, whatever. He didn't have the best day. But, um, you know, most of us, I think Yom Kippur, very powerful day. 
right? We're getting inspired and we're, we're into it and we're screaming about life, we're looking, right? Wherever you were, right? Just remember, it wasn't long ago. 12 hours ago, where were you? 13, right? 12 hours ago, 18 hours ago, where were you? You were, we were praying, we were crying. Hashem wa Elohim and uh, Aneni Hashem and singing the Anenus and Adon Aseli, right? Wherever you were, I think Yom Kippur, we could agree, is a powerful day. You feel God in the synagogue. You feel close to Him. It's also a day, by the way, that the rabbi is on his best speech ever, right? You know how, you know how hard it is for me to prepare my speech for Yom Kippur? It's like, for me, it's like this speech of the year. I make sure I give him the, my best goods. Right? So you're in shul. You're, you're inspired. Yom Kippur, very powerful day. Also, the bidding is exciting, right? Depending on how much you go for. Right? So it's an exciting day. It's an inspiring day. And I think, I think everybody, everybody, no matter how off we are the rest of the year, I think Yom Kippur, we're, we're coming back to ourselves and we're honest with ourselves and we say, you know what? God, I, I am messed up. I have messed up. I have done bad things. And we're honest with God. We say, you know what? I khalti, I ate on the fast day. And I didn't sit in the sukkah. And I didn't say a bracha. And I didn't say a Right? When you're going through the vidui, right? We're like, holy cow. I'm doing, I'm, oh my God. Yeah, I did that one. Yeah, that's me. Yes, yes, yeah. Right? <laughs> holy cow, right? I did all of these averot. It's like, you see a whole like 15 pages of Aleph and Bet. You think none of it's going to be you. And all of a sudden you realize that we're all of them. So I think Yom Kippur is really very powerful day, an inspiring day. But my friends, there's a very big mistake that we can make. There's a very big mistake that you and I can make. And that is to leave the inspiration of Yom Kippur for Yom Kippur. And the moment it's over, Hashem, see you later. See you next year. Al-Bal Kilsine, Skishrabot, And to leave the inspiration and to never come back, I'll see you next year. That is the biggest mistake because the goal of Yom Kippur is not to leave the day there, but to bring the day with the rest of us. My friend Ariel Sassoon told me something very, very powerful. My friends, listen to this. You got to hear this. It's going to change. It's going to change how you view Yom Kippur and Ne'ilah. Watch this. What does Ne'ilah mean? Ne'ilah means to close. Right? We pray. We try to get in every prayer before the gates close. But don't forget, my friends, the gates are closing with us on the inside of them, not on the outside. You understand? The gates are closing with us inside. We're going in with God. They're not closing on us and we're like on the outside of the gates banging, let us in, let us in. No, 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 no. The gates are, ba- are closing and we're inside and move- we're moving into an amazing year with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. If we get inspired from Yom Kippur, but the gates close and we say, all right, God, see you next year, we completely miss the point. The goal is to carry the inspiration with us to today, to tomorrow, to the morning after, to the next week, to the next year, to keep the eye going with us. Rabotai, you know why the Kohen Gadol washes his hand time number 10? The 10th washing is maybe the most important washing because all of the washings of the day have to do with the Avodah in the Beit HaMikdash. But he washes time number 10 because he's about to do the most important Avodah. He's about to do the most important part of the day, the most important service. And what is that? Bring the Avodah from the temple back with him into his house. That's the most important and the most difficult part of the day. And so he washes his hand time number 10 as he's ready to leave. As he's ready to walk out, he washes because right now I'm actually doing the hardest part. Now I got to bring it all with me. Back to Avenue U. Back to my house, wherever you live. Out of the synagogue and back onto my, onto my building, into my house. This is the, this is the washing of the 10th time. And so as we, as we exit Yom Kippur, my friends, <clears throat> we're still on a high. We have to be real about the Kabbalot that we made. We all made resolutions. What were they? We made a resolution, hopefully it was something small, hopefully it was something concrete, hopefully it was something that we could actually uh, write down and monitor, track our progress. Because to say I'm going to be better, is that Hashem? But it's very vague. What do you mean I want to be better? How could you track that? Could you monitor? Could you gauge? To be better is too vague, un- unacceptable. The goal of Yom Kippur is to be better, but to make a Kabbalah. How are you going to be better? In what specific way? 
I, hopefully, right? Ideally, it should be one way meant to God and one way meant to men. Whether it's brachot or praying or learning, and then man to man. I'm going to do something to be better, more patient. I'm going to not interrupt someone. I'm going to listen to people talk, right? Etc., etc. So our goal of Yom Kippur is to take a Kabbalah from man to God and to take a Kabbalah of man to man and to make it real. But we have to make sure that the Kabbalah doesn't just remain for Yom Kippur. Because then today we get uninspired. <sighs> oh, Baruch Hashem, it's over. Let's eat. And we don't, uh, we don't stick to what, we, to what we promised. And then it turns out that our grand opening was a going out of business. And the great, the great day of Yom Kippur remains on Yom Kippur. And we close the gates and we close the day and we close the door. And we don't see God again until next year. And our Kabbalot remain on that piece of paper. And we don't bring him with us. That would be a very, very big mistake. They say a man once threw a party. Big, wealthy guy threw a party, wedding. And he invited everybody in town, both rich and poor. No exceptions. Make sense? Make sense, no? Invite everybody, rich and poor. The guy's a wealthy guy. He's not going to leave people out of his wedding. So he invites everyone in town to his wedding. And all of a sudden, the rich people, they have what to wear, they have what to dress, they have what to jewelry. The poor people, they realize they have no clothing, they have no jewelry. What are they going to wear? So, you know what they did? They went out, they borrowed. The poor people went out, they borrowed uh, diamond necklaces, rings, earrings, each one. She said, listen, you know, could I borrow for this wedding? And the wealthy women, they said, you know, of course, why not? I have extra, I'm not wearing it. I can let you borrow it. So she gives her her jewelry, she gives them the, and you have everyone now showing up to this wedding. Everyone's dressed beautifully. Everyone's dressed with the top jewelry, with their clothing, their finest. And if you add the wedding, my friends, and you look around, everyone looks like they're rich. Everyone's got, you know, the Louboutin shoes, you know, with the red on the bottom. Everyone's got the fancy, expensive earrings. Everyone's got a very expensive suit. You could tell the quality, rich and poor alike. All the men, they're wearing, you know, Ferragamo. So how do you know who's really rich and who's really poor? How do you know, my friends, who's really rich and who's really poor? All the ladies are wearing the same caliber jewelry. You know what the answer is? There's one way to know. You got to come back the next day. You got to look at them the morning after and then see who still has the jewelry and then see who gave it back. And then you know who's really rich and who's really poor. What a beautiful example. On Yom Kippur, my friends, we're all rich. Whether you're religious, you're observant, you're not. Everyone's in shul. Everyone's praying. Everyone's crying. We're all, really, on Yom Kippur, we're all rich. Everybody is the same. Wearing talit, rabbi, layman, we're all the same. But how do you know who's really, really rich? Who really purchased goods on Yom Kippur? You gotta come back the next morning. On the next day... You got to look around and see who's still learning. Look at this class, Baruch Hashem. All of you, you come back the next morning. And by the way, you're not here today because it's the morning after. I know every name here. You hear every day, Baruch Hashem. Because Baruch Hashem, we're really rich. Our Kabbalot weren't fake. We brought them with us for the entire year. What we promised, we plan on keeping. We're, stu- we're grand opening and we're not going out of business. We know that the upcoming year has a very important avodah and therefore we wash our hands even today because we know that it's not about yesterday. Yesterday was only a sample of what's to come. We got to take it, carry it with us Hashem, for the rest of the year. Hashem should help us stay true to our Kabbalot. Okay, the Kabbalah that we made, we got we to gotta make sure that we commit to it. By the way, if I could just add one more point. The Kohen washes his hands. But what else does he wash besides his hands? He washes his feet. What does that mean? Washing my, why am I washing my feet? Very interesting idea, no? Washing your feet. I mean, think about it. Me and you, when you come into shul, you wash your hands, no? You do netila yadayim. Before I have bread, I don't, give my, I don't give my guests to wash their feet. Okay, I hope you don't either. What is that netila teraglayim? Never heard of that one. 
But my friends, and this is the final point for today. You know, we make our kabbalot, we make our resolutions. Think of a resolution that you made. I'll give you an example of a resolution that some people have, may have made. I'm going to stop speaking gossip. Okay, that's a good one. But you know what? So much of the gossip that we talk is because of the environment and the surrounding that we're in. Why do we speak gossip? It's because we find ourselves at an audience. We find ourselves in the company of certain people. And we know whenever we're them, they're always going to talk certain things. I know whenever I'm with this, pe- with this person, I'm going to eat this food. And so much of the Kabbalah that we made, I'm going to keep Shabbat better, I'm going to keep kosher better. But a lot of that has sometimes le- less to do with us, more to do with the situation that we're in. I'm hanging out with X, Y, and Z, and I know on Shabbat, this is what they do. And then I'm all of a sudden tempted to now go and be with them. So besides the Kabbalah of keeping Shabbat, we have to ask ourselves, what am I going to do to ensure that my Shabbat is not going to be tested, to be broken by the people that I'm with? You know, I would say maybe bigger than the Kabbalah is the Kabbalah of preventing. Asking ourselves, well, if I want to not speak gossip, I also have to make sure that I'm not in a certain audience that at this time that they speak gossip. You understand what I'm saying? And this is why the Kohen washes his feet. My friends, take a look. Look at this. When you wash your hands, that's to make sure that I'm not going to do anything bad. But when he washes his feet, that's to make sure that I won't find myself in a situation that I'm going to be tempted to do that bad thing. Isn't that beautiful? The feet what do. The hand, excuse me, the hands is what, what do the sin. But the feet take me to the place that I do the sin at. So we got to wash both. We got to make sure that we're avoiding the sin. We got to make sure that we're avoiding even the temptation to sin. Staying away from the drama. If you know your friends, uh, they do bad things and you want to stop doing those bad things, you may want to say, you know what, from now on, I avoid those hangouts. I avoid those situations. That's what the washing of the feet comes to include. So anyways, a lot to digest over here. Hashem should help us carry our Kabbalah to the next year to make sure that we kissed the Torah yesterday. It's not going to be the last time that we kiss it till Yom Kippur. We're going to kiss it again Shabbat. And we're going to kiss it every Shabbat. And we're going to come. And we're going to be wearing the jewelry, not only at the wedding, but we're rich. And we have our jewelry even the next day. We don't have to give it back. We could carry it with us. Hashem should help us to stay true to our resolutions, to, tra- to stay true to the inspiration that we all gained on Yom Kippur, Bezrat Hashem. And it'll carry us through the rest of the year. Stop it here, everybody. Have a wonderful day, God willing. We'll see you all tomorrow. Bye-bye.